this evening the first three verses in Ezekiel chapter 23 is our passage, so let's read all three verses together here tonight. Ezekiel chapter 21, verses 1, 2, and 3. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face toward Jerusalem, and drop thy word toward the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel, and say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, and will draw forth my sword out of his sheath, and will cut off from thee the righteous and the wicked. And Lord, please tonight give us understanding, help us to to learn and grow together, be challenged. I pray that you again fill and strengthen our preacher as he preaches your word. Meet with us, Lord, and we'll thank you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. I'm relatively sure that I am cheating you, cheating you of all the things that could be said from the book of Ezekiel. But that's all right. We need to move right along in our study. And in our, in our time together in this book, I know we could, it's just like the book of Proverbs. When we first taught Proverbs, it took us four years, nine months, and eight days to go through Proverbs. It took us nearly five years to go through the book of Psalms, of all things. I believe it was, again, four years and nine months and so many days, even in the book of Psalms. We've gone through uh, Daniel. We've gone through so many different books, Song of Solomon. We spend time in each of those chapters. I uh, heard just this week of another man who's planning on teaching through the book of Song of Solomon. I wish I could send him my notes, <laughs> the notes that we had for our study of Song of Solomon. We're good. Remember what I promised you? I promised the entire church family you could bring your children to every service and never have to worry about being embarrassed about anything that was said because we taught the book of Song of Solomon in its proper context. And the context is so very, very important. And so tonight, before I pray, uh, the title of tonight's Bible study or message, whatever you'd like to call it, is Should We Then Make Mirth? Should We Then Make Mirth? Our Heavenly Father, I am, I am, I am too weak and unknowledgeable to bring a proper study, but I'm going to do my best tonight, and I need you. And you said that your strength was made perfect in our weakness. And if that be true, and I believe that it is, then Lord, I believe you'll make sense of each thing that is said tonight. Help me, I pray. Teach all of us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In this chapter, God pictures himself as a soldier with a sword drawn. If you're one who takes notes and you want to put things in your Bible or in your note page, the one that we provide in the bulletin each week, you could put that down. God pictures himself as a soldier with his sword drawn, ready to attack. And this is a picture of imminent judgment. Remember, these people have been given literally hundreds of years to be able to get right with God. But they refused. They said it's someone else's fault. They weren't willing to accept personal responsibility. They'd never heard the sermon that I heard that said that every churn has to sit on its own bottom not realizing that uh, they, they thought it was always somebody else's fault. They said, oh, judgment ought to come, just not to us, you see. Well, it's a picture of, of imminent judgment. And the key phrase in the entire chapter is found in verse 10. And if you'll just look down the page there, verse number 10, it says, it is sharpened to make a sore slaughter. It is furbished that it may glitter. Should we then make mirth? It contemneth the rod of my son as every tree. Facing judgment is supposed to be a time of mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. That's what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a time of mirth or joyfulness. It's supposed to be a time of mourning. And too often we enjoy our sins instead of confessing them. Let me say that again. All too often we enjoy our sins as opposed to confessing them. We're cheerful, not mournful. And when a nation is facing judgment, it is a tragic if Christians enjoy their freedom while they ignore their very imminent future. It's a very, very sad thing. Many today are living happily in the land of their own backsliddenness, living happily in the land of their own sinfulness. They, because judgment has not fallen yet, are thinking that judgment may not fall. 
at least not on them. It's like the article that I read in the Christian magazine that I have reminded you of many times. They said in that magazine, a famous Christian publication, if I named it, you all would know the title of it. But they said the reason that preachers no longer preach on the rapture of all believers is because it hadn't happened yet, which I thought was one of the dumbest things I had ever read in my entire life. I took that magazine to my pastor who was standing at the credenza as you walked into the church office area there, and I showed it to him, and I said, well, if the rapture happened, there wouldn't be a need to preach on the rapture. And he laughed right along with me. Well, because judgment has not necessarily been seen by many Christians, perhaps they think that judgment is not coming And today there are many believers who, because they have not yet seen the wage of sin in their own life, think that maybe they are free from its consequences. Our nation is in such a condition today. We must not simply enjoy our freedom, but we must use our freedom to bring our nation back to God. We hear time and time again, we need to bring America back to God. But how many of God's people today are actively involved in trying to do that? One might say, but what can I do? Do your part. You don't have to do anyone else's part. You do your part. Getting the seed out of the barn. Getting on your knees and praying. Learning the word of God. Being obedient to the Lord. Being a witness as you should be. Do your part and don't worry about someone else's part. We have received a Christian publication here at the church for a number of years, there was always an article in that paper. I don't believe we receive, in fact, I know we don't receive it anymore. It has now gone to an electronic publication. But there was always an article in there that said, Winning our, bringing our nation back to God one soul at a time. One soul at a time. You may never stand in a pulpit and you may never stand behind a lectern, but you stand in front of people every day of your life practically And you have a responsibility to witness to them and get the gospel to them. You may not be able to win thousands, but if you only won one, that would be fine. What I'm saying is, is that we each need to do our part. We must not waste our lives in frivolity or frivolous activity. It is a time for mourning, not mirth, when it comes to the condition of our nation. I have been asked twice now what I thought about the shooting in Colorado Springs. It was totally and completely wrong and should never have been done. And five people dead and more than 20 injured in a, in a shooting here in Colorado Springs. I understand it's made the national news. There are some who will say, oh, they got what they deserve. Can I just say, if all of us got what we deserve, we would all go to hell tonight. None of us deserve life and none of us deserve heaven. None. And it's terrible when things like that happen. The condition of our nation and right down the road from us, an abortion clinic, where every day of the week practically there are a few people standing out in front on the street carrying their signs and they have their chairs to sit in on occasion and there they are protesting the the murdering of the unborn. Right down the road from us, are you hearing what I'm saying? And when was it the Congress or the Senate of one state that stood and applauded when they approved abortion up to the ninth month until a child was born? It's no wonder God is angry at the wicked every day. You say, but what can I do? You do your part. You don't worry about someone else's part. You do your part. Constant depression, however, is also wrong. I'm not saying that God's people ought to walk around with a sad sack face. That's also a sin. Walking around in depression and, and, and sadness all the time. We got to make a distinction between mourning over our nation's sins and being depressed over our personal circumstances. Not everybody has good circumstances. We need to mourn over our nation rather than be merry while our nation deserves judgment. Mourning leads to, hear me now, mourning leads to repentance and depression leads to defeat. Let me say it again. Mourning leads to the repentance while depression leads to defeat. A person could have a mournful heart over over a burden for their nation, 
my pastor, one of the few men that I know of personally, who actually had a burden for the nation, for our nation, America, who would spread a map, a map out in his office. And there he would crawl on that map on his hands and knees. And there he would pray and pray and pray for our nation, going past each city, praying for cities by name, that God would raise up a man of God who would preach in that city the truth of the word of God and that people would be saved in that city. And I remember this, we were flying one time across the nation. I looked out the jet window and I looked down and I thought there was not a town beneath us that was not touched by his ministry. But how many people do you know personally who have a mourning, a burden for this old nation of ours? Most of the time our prayers are God is good and God is great and we thank him for the food in our plate, amen. Rather than actually praying that God would spare our nation or at least be merciful to it. On Wednesday nights here, we pray for our nation, don't we? And I don't ever ask God to shed his grace on America, though I wish he would. I always ask God to be merciful. And I don't ask him to be merciful for me. I ask him to be merciful at least for the next generation, for my children and for their children, and perhaps one day their children's children, if the Lord tarries is coming. Constant depression in a person's life produces illness, <clears throat> sometimes even death. Sometimes they call it clinical depression, or they get depressed over their circumstances. That's different than mourning over your nation, you see. What is the solution? Although this is a time for mourning, it is essential that a Christian has a merry heart. And you know, uh, I try to be happy. I try to, to show happiness to others. I don't walk around with a sad sack face. I don't walk around uh, uh, with, my, as Curtis Hudson said, my mouth will look like a sucker fish to where I don't open it wide and ask God for his blessings. The Bible says in Proverbs 15 and verse 13, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. That's the way a Christian ought to live, but he ought to be mournful over the sins of the nation. He ought to be mourning over his own personal sins. But as I said earlier, uh, many Christians, uh, they ignore their own sins while they think others' sins are horrible. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 15, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. I believe, uh, I believe you ought to be happy. I believe you ought to have a happy countenance about you. That doesn't mean you're not mourning over our nation, but that means you have, as the songwriter says, I have the joy of the Lord, uh, which is my strength. Proverbs 17 and verse 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Here's the interesting thing. If we make fun uh, the purpose of our lives, then we're making mirth. Enjoying your Christianity. Uh, some uh, Listen, you hear all kinds of things about people that walk around with a sourpuss face. They say nothing good. I've got nothing to rejoice over. I have nothing to give a testimony about. I have nothing in my life that makes me happy. Oh, yeah, there are those. But the truth is, uh, if we, our purpose in our life, if we make it fun, serving the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Serving the Lord, uh, it's no wonder so many today don't want to serve the Lord because there are so many sad sack Christians. You know, missionaries come back and talk about receiving used tea bags and worn out tennis shoes from churches as they send them things. And the church says, well, they ought to be thankful for everything we send. Well, the truth of the matter is they ought to be thankful, but churches need to be more conscientious of what they send to their missionaries. If we use fun to brighten our lives, we are making merry, and that's a good thing. And if we live for fun, our lives will be frivolous. If all you do is live for fun, if we live without fun, our lives will be miserable. And I mean that. I like to be, I, I'm, I'm an introvert personally. I really honestly am. I've often said, give me a stick and a piece of paper and put me in a corner someplace and I'll be happy for as long as I'm there. I talk to people, I pull myself out of myself and I talk to people and try to be friendly to folks as much as I possibly can. I've tried to be friendly to folks who don't like me in the past. And, I, and when I meet people that I know have a problem with me, I try to always talk with them. That's why I always talk to you people every time you walk in the building. Keep that in mind. But I try to show a happy countenance. I go to the post office. I, I say howdy, howdy to people that I meet there. When I go to the store, I talk to the clerks. I'll talk to them while I'm, I'm checking uh, something out. Maybe I'm making a purchase. And I'll say to the individual, I'll say, what, how you 
What kind of a day are you having? Is it a busy day? Oh, it's not a busy day today. Or they'll say, boy, we are really overrun today. And I say, do they call that job securities? Often they will smile at me and say, yeah, that's job security. We hope so. Walk into a fast food restaurant and order up your, 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 uh, your double Whopper with cheese minus ketchup with extra onion on it and, and get you a Diet Coke to wash it all down and, uh, and get all that and say to the individual that's there something happy, something fun, something uh, that might make them smile. And all the and often when I walk out, and I don't go often, but often when I walk out of a place, and the people that, who waited on me are still there at the counter, I'll say thank you for the good meal. You did a good job. I try to encourage them. Uh, they used to have, I believe it was at Long John Silver's, you could ring a bell on your way out the door if they did a good job. Ding, and you ring it, and that encourages them because then you'd hear them holler uh, from the way back. They would say thank you, thank you. And uh, all is important to do. But everybody needs to see the joy of the Lord as your strength, you see. Uh, he fills your heart with laughter. He fills your heart with joy and all those things. If we live without fun, though, we're going to live a miserable life. And I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you know somebody who lives a miserable Christian life? I think we all know somebody like that. In our last time together, we focused on Israel's history. And uh, just by a quick way of review, we learn about their history of rebellion. We learned about their rebellion in Egypt. And that was chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 9, where the people of Israel did not get rid of their idols as God had instructed them to do. We learned about their rebellion in the wilderness in Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 10 through 26, the, where the people refused to obey God's laws. We learned about their rebellion in Canaan in chapter 20, verses 27 and 28, and they continued to blaspheme and to betray their God. And then we learned about their rebellion during Ezekiel's time. And that was chapter 20 and chapter 21 as well, verses 1 through 5 and verse 24. We find in this chapter that they continue to sin and they are not ashamed of their sin. And you know, the Bible even tells us in the New Testament there are some who uh, live in sin and they do things that the unsaved world is ashamed to speak of, but they speak of these things proudly. God has become their enemy in Ezekiel and will unleash his anger on them. And remember that God is not willing that any should perish, but he gave them many, many years to repent and get right with God. Now we come to Ezekiel chapter 21 and they continue in their rebellion. And God has become their enemy, and we learn here what's going to happen to them. We're going to read a number of passages that are found here. So if you're one who puts down things like in order, you're going to appreciate how we're going to do this now. They were neither repentant nor were they ashamed of their evil ways, and God's anger is going to be unleashed on them, and he's warning them through the prophet Ezekiel. First of all, notice this. The evil, the judgment of God is going to be unleashed upon the wicked prince of Israel. Who is that? That's King Zedekiah, Judah's first ruler. If you have your Bible there, we're going to look at Ezekiel 21, verses 25 through 27. It says, And thou profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, when iniquity shall have an end, Thus saith the Lord God, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. So we find there that God is angry with Zedekiah, and he's called the wicked prince of Israel. Now he also says, that he's going to unleash his anger. Well, you know, that's a scary thought, to unleash something. You think of a man who has a dog on a leash, and that dog is jumping up towards you, and all he shows is his teeth, and he growls, and he barks, and he's jumping at the end of that leash, jumping up trying to get to you, and you're hoping that his master won't let it go. God says here he's going to unleash his anger but he's also going to unleash his anger upon the pagans. Now, who are the pagans? That's anybody. He's referring to anybody outside of those who believe in God, the God of Israel. And here judgment is handed down against the Ammonites and their uh, many national sins. 
chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. Again, chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. And thou, son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God concerning the Ammonites and concerning their reproach, even say thou, The sword, the sword is drawn, for the slaughter is furbished and consume because of the glittering, whiles they see vanity unto thee, whiles they divine a lie unto thee, to bring thee upon the necks of them that are slain, of the wicked whose day is come, when their iniquity shall be uh, shall have an end. Shall I cause it to return unto his sheep? I will judge thee in the place where thou wast created, in the land of thy nativity, and I will pour out mine indignation upon thee. I will blow against thee in the fire of my wrath and deliver thee unto the hand of brutish men and skillful to destroy. Thou shalt be for fuel to the fire. Thy blood shall be in the midst of the land. Thou shalt be more remembered, for I, the Lord, have spoken it. You've gone camping before, and your fire just about went out. And somebody said, throw another log on. Or what's the next thing they tell you to do? Blow on it. And God gave that picture here. He's going to blow on the fire, which causes it to spark and to flame up. So we're not talking about just judgment here. We're talking about complete judgment. God draws the picture. Now, All that just as a beginning thing for you to realize how angry God is at their rebellion and then their sin. And apparently not just for God's people, but also for the pagan nations around them. So Ezekiel once again acts out his message of judgment. He acts it out. So look at the, he gives a number of illustrations here. Let me show them to you. The first illustration is this. Let me show you what he does. The first illustration what he does. Now, if you're taking notes and you're going to write things down, this is going to be the basic outline. The first illustration, what he does and what it means. The second illustration, what he does and what it means and so forth. So you realize which direction we're going. The first illustration, what he does, chapter 21 and verse 6. It says, Sigh, therefore, Thou son of man, with the breaking of thy loins, and with bitterness sigh before their eyes. So what does he do? He groans, he sighs. Oh, can you imagine the brokenness that he shows in his groaning, in his sighing in this prophecy? But what does it mean? Look at verse 17. And, as he continues, or not verse 17, verse 7. And it shall be when they say unto thee, Wherefore sighest thou that thou shalt answer? For the tidings, because it cometh, and every heart shall melt, and all hands shall be feeble, and every spirit shall faint, and all knees shall be weak as water. Behold, it cometh and shall be brought to pass, saith the Lord. So what did he do? He groaned. He sighed. And notice the Bible says he did it twice, mentions it twice. And it's going to be Jerusalem's reaction at Babylonian army as the Babylonian army marches in against the city. He sees all of this. He acts it out. What a terrible day of judgment it's going to be. And so notice the second illustration that is given. What he does, verse 12. What he does, verse 12. Cry and howl, son of man, for it shall be upon my people. It shall be upon all the princes of Israel. Terrors by reason of the sword shall be upon my people. Smite, therefore, upon thy thigh. So what did he do? He beats on his thigh. In other words, he's he's not just standing up, giving a Bible study in a monotone voice. First thing he says to do, he says, I want you to groan. Then he says, I want you to slap your leg, get the people's attention. What does it mean? What, what What did it mean? Chapter 21, verses 8 through 11. Follow along. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, say, A sword, a sword is sharpened and also furbished. It is sharpened to make sore the slaughter. It is furbished that it may glitter, uh, uh, that it may glitter. Should we then make mirth? It contemneth the rod of my son as every tree, and he hath given it to be furbished that it may be handled. 
Uh, the, this sword is sharpened and it is furbished to give it into the hand of the slayer. So what did it mean when he did this? Well, soon the enemy's swords will pierce through the hearts of Judah's people. It's, it's going to be sharpened. It's going to be glittering. It's, going to be, it's not going to be some old unsharpened short sword that is not cared for. The judgment is going to be complete. Then he gave a third illustration. What he does is verses 13 through 16 of chapter 21. He said, because it is a trial, and what if the sword contemn even the rod? It shall be no more, saith the Lord God. Thou therefore, son of man, prophesy and smite thy hands together and let the sword be doubled in uh, the third time, the sword of the slain. It is the sword of the great men that are slain, which entereth into their privy, cham privy chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates that their heart may faint and their ruins may be multiplied. Ah, it is made bright. It is wrapped up for the slaughter. Go thee one way or other, either on the right hand or on the left, whithersoever thy face is set. What does he do here? The Bible says he claps his hands. And just like you looked up at me when I clapped my hands right then, he wanted the people to hear what he had to say. And it gave meaning. And what it was, he clapped his hands and he slashes a sword to, from the left to the right. What was he saying? It means in verse 17, it says, I will also smite my hands together and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have said it. The same message is conveyed as that of the second illustration. And what was that message? If you'll look back in your notes, soon enemy swords are going to pierce through the hearts of Judah's people. So he repeated the lesson by the clapping of his hands and the, and the swishing back and forth of the sword. And then there was a fourth illustration that he gave. What he does, chapter 21, verses 18 through 21 the word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, Also, thou son of man, appoint thee two ways, that the sword of the king of Babylon may come. Both twain shall uh, come forth out of one land, and choose thou a place. Choose it if the head of the way uh, to the city. Appoint a way, that the sword may come to Reboth uh, of the Ammonites, and to Judah in Jerusalem, uh, the defense. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way, at the head of two ways, to use divination. He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. So what did he do? Well, he draws a map showing two roads with a fork in the middle of it. And by the way, what does it mean he looked into the liver? When I read this and studied it, I thought, well, that's just an odd phrase, but it's not something odd back then. It's what heathen nations did. It was, a way, it, was, it was like tea leaves in the bottom of a cup. It was like tarot cards that some heathen may use. It was like fortune telling. It was like a Ouija board. And they would look into the liver and just another mode of divination, if a healthy or, or if it was healthy or double, uh, and the, uh, the lobes inclined inward, the omen was favorable. But uh, if it was a diseased or too dry or without a lobe or without a band between the parts, the omen was unfavorable. And that's how they predicted their future, by looking into that liver of an animal. Now, what did it mean what Ezekiel did when he drew a map with two roads with a fork in the middle of it? Verses 22 and 23. At his right hand was the divination for Jerusalem to appoint captains to, to open the mouth in the slaughter to lift up the voice with shouting, to appoint battering rams against the gates, to cast a mount and to build a fort, and it shall be unto them as a false divination in their sight, to them that have sworn oaths, but he will call to remembrance the iniquity, and they shall be taken. So what was he trying to say to the people? Listen carefully. It signifies that the king of Babylon is going to decide to attack Jerusalem before the Ammonite capital city of Reboth. He's talking about the attack, the destruction, the death that's going to come. He gave them, and all this not only is biblical, but it's also historical of what has happened. Now, that all sounds terrible, and I, I realize a message like this just sounds nothing but gruesome. But we're talking about a God of righteousness who hates iniquity. 
It says twice in the Bible of the Lord Jesus, once in the Old Testament as a, as a messianic prophecy, and once in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, it says, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. If we want to be Christ-like, we have to love righteousness and hate iniquity. The people of God had gotten used to their sin. And the Bible teaches us in previous lessons that they committed these things, they were unrepentant, and they were not ashamed of what they were doing. What they did was out in the open. And sometimes, as we learned about the elders of Israel, the ancients of Israel, they had a secret place where they had a chamber called a chamber of imagery. And in there they had false gods and they had these tapestries and paintings that were around on the walls of all these heathen false gods. And said, so see what they do in the dark. They weren't ashamed of what they were doing. They continued even though God had given them warning. Say, pastor, that's terrible. That sounds a lot like America today. It honestly does. There's a lot of parallels here. It's no wonder W.A. Criswell's book had a chapter. I didn't even read it. I just read the title about America in Ezekiel. Not that America's mentioned in Ezekiel because he wasn't talking about that, but he was talking about this, the parallels between America and what the God's people were doing in the word of God. Now, look up here, and I want to finish on a positive note, if I may. In spite of their terrible sins, God is going to one of these days regenerate, regather, and restore his people. That's his promise. He didn't say he was going to do it right then. But he said, it's going to happen. God doesn't give up on his own. Fooey on that new theology today that says that God's people are no longer God's people. Fooey on them who say that Christians today are, uh, are the Israel, uh, the New Testament Israel. Fooey on those who deny the fact that God says they're going to be his people for all eternity and made that promise. Fooey on them for not studying their Bible and reading in the New Testament of all places, that God would set them aside for a while and then would bring them back and restore them. Ezekiel chapter 20, beginning in verse 33, we understand that God is not willing that any of his people should perish, but every one of them should come to repentance. Verse 33 says, As I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out, I will rule over you. And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein ye are scattered <clears throat> with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God, and I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. You see, God made a promise and he was never going to break it. Judgment, that didn't mean they were going to be free from judgment because of their rebellion. God just says, I'm not going to break my word to you. Uh, bond of the covenant, and I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me, and I will bring them forth out of the country uh, where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go ye, serve ye every one his idols, and hereafter, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols, for in mine holy mountain in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall be all the house of Israel and of them in the land. Serve me. There will I accept them. And there will I require your offerings and the first fruits of your oblations. With all your holy things, I will accept you with your sweet savor when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries wherein ye have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen, and ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up my hand to give it to your fathers. And there shall ye remember your ways and all your doings wherein ye have been defiled. And ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that ye have committed. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have wrought with you for my name's sake, not according to your wicked ways, nor according to your corrupt doings. O ye house of Israel, saith the Lord God. 
in this rather lengthy little passage that we just read, God shows his mercy. He hates sin, but he loves righteousness. And he's never going to throw his people out. He's never going to throw them away. He will not throw this baby out with a dirty diaper. No, he'll not run this car over a cliff because it's got dirty or got the ashtrays all messed up. No, the sin's going to be punished, but God loves his people and he's going to bring them back. I say fooey on that new theology, that, that progressive theology that many today have accepted and say that the Jewish people are no longer God's people. Yes, he lines out here what they did in the past. In the New Testament, he lines out their rejection of the Lord Jesus there. He talks about how he set them aside for a little while, but how he's going to bring them back, he's going to bring them back into the land, and they're his people, and he loves them, and he loves them still. They're God's chosen people. Christians are not God's chosen people. No, oh, they quote the verse, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Oh, give me a context, please. Who was he talking to? What was it about? Oh, this, this business of this new theology, this progressive theology that people are embracing today. God loves his people. He hates their sin. And let me say this, God loves each one of you too. But I want to say to all of you, God hates your sin too. And just because you're saved and you're living in the New Testament times doesn't mean that any one of us are going to get away with the wrongdoing that we choose to do, with the rebellion that we choose to do. But God's never going to give you up. He's never going to do that. Ah, in the book of Hosea. Yeah, in the book of Hosea. What a marvelous book that is. Uh, he says, I'm going to write you a bill of divorcement to his people. But then he says in a couple of chapters later, he says, but how can I give thee up? How can I give thee up? No, he says in one, I please, I believe it's in Isaiah, don't quote me, but I believe it's in Isaiah where he says, I have forsaken you for a little while. I have forsaken you just for a little while. Oh, but pastor, doesn't the Bible say that he will never leave us nor forsake us? Uh, it's a different context from one testament to the other. But he said of Israel, I'll set you aside for a while, but you'll come back and I'll want you re and I'll restore you. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Oh, and many of them paid for their sins. Yes, they did. Oh, and yes, we will. But we'll never lose that wonderful salvation that we have. We are God's people. Thank God for that. And God is not willing that any should perish. And that's why preachers today need to be preaching the word of God to their people. And it may not all be quickly understood by all the people. It may not even sometimes be understood by the man who preaches it or the person who teaches it in a Sunday school class. But the truth of the matter is it's the word of God. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. And that means where there is no open oracle of God, where there is no spoken word of God, where there is no word of God preached, where it is not presented, where it is not uh, given out in the power of God, said the people perish. That's why preachers in the day need to get into their Bibles and teach and preach to their people the word of God. Uh, my pastor taught us a long time ago. He says, if someone says, well, I, I read the Bible and I, I, none of it sticks. I don't understand all of it. He said, it just sort of like goes in one ear and out the other. And he said, yeah, you pour water through a strainer. It's not going to hold a lot of water. He says, but you'll have a cleaner strainer before it's all said and done. When I thought about that, I thought about how much Bible we should hear, how much of it we retain. But if we have none of it, the Bible says we're clean through the word that he spoke to us. We need to hear the word of God. He sent Ezekiel to the people. I said, you preach to them and you tell them their sins got them in trouble now. We've had enough. I've had all I can handle with it. We've done everything that we can do. And now it's time for judgment, but also remind them that they're still my people. Remind them that I still love them. Remind them that I will be a sanctuary for them in the wilderness. Remind them that one day I'll restore them and I'll take care of them. Why? Because they're my people. Shall we bow for prayer? Now, Heavenly Father, thank you.